Welcome back to the podcast. We have another special episode for you today with special guest Alana Scardino. Uh, how are you doing today, Alana? I'm doing super good. It's sunny here today. So it's after some weird snowstorms out in Western Mass, we're, we're back on track to what spring should be looking like. Yeah, the weather is definitely pretty bad this week. And so on this podcast, we talk about emotional intelligence, mental health, and self-love. Have any of these topics really been on your mind as of late? I mean, yeah, I feel like they've been on a lot of people's minds, especially through this past year. The whole pandemic has not been easy on any, anybody, and I think it's really exacerbated a lot of people's, uh, I don't know, exacerbated a lot of people's mental health struggles, and I'm not unique in that. Uh, I think uh, whenever I'm thinking about navigating that mental health kind of challenge, um, I guess speaking from my own experience, when the pandemic hit, I was unable to, uh, to keep meeting with my counselor because we shifted to kind of like a remote setting. I didn't really have an environment around me where that really worked for me. So I was kind of just, I had some past experiences going to counselors and therapists. I thought that was super helpful and super awesome for me. I highly recommend it to anybody because I think it's super helpful to get to speak to like a neutral uh, trained professional because I think that's one of the best things you can do for yourself if you have the means, but that's not always an option. Uh, but having to stop that kind of those conversations on a weekly basis kind of left me to navigate a lot of what I was going through just by myself, which is fine uh, because I have a lot of other outlets that have helped me from kind of having tunnel vision. I think having tunnel vision is one of those things that really gets me like most down in the mud sometimes if I'm only thinking about one specific thing or if I'm focused, hyper-focused or obsessive about certain stressors in my life. And I'm, even if I'm tunnel focused on a whole bunch of different stressors, but can't see the greater good around it or the, the good that I'm putting into the world or the good that the world is showing to me. So definitely kind of navigated that a little bit more independently through different outlets, um, getting outside, being active, trying to, I don't know, hold myself accountable to be responsible while also cutting myself some slack because it is an unprecedented time. So um, I have definitely, I'm not unique in how mental health has affected me and it affects so many people, but definitely is a topic that I feel like I could definitely speak to as far as how it's impacted my life. Yeah, no, I love that. So when would you say that your kind of journey, I would call it with mental health started? Because I know for me, I never really paid attention to my emotions and emotional intelligence because we weren't taught that and guys are, aren't supposed to be, you know, emotional and worry about that. So I kind of bottled it all up and it kind of affected me negatively my freshman year in college when I started going through depression and anxiety. So when do you feel like you really started paying more attention to your mental health and your emotions? Yeah, good question. And I mean, if I, I've never really thought about this, but if I, if I have to look back on it, I think towards the later stages of high school, when I was kind of winding down with the academics, didn't really care so much about getting grades as senior year of high school. And I'm like trying to figure out what else I can focus on. I really started thinking about all the gaps in kind of our health education, because we speak a lot on kind of uh, just like physical health, like anatomy, uh, like reproductive health, all that kind of stuff in at least my school district and my school. Uh, but the mental health aspect wasn't spoken on as much unless it was kind of paired with drug abuse and alcohol abuse. So being able to recognize that gap and say like, we never really learned about this stuff and we never really learned what exactly are these mental health issues. So it was kind of like, it had lacked that credibility in my mind as far as something that is recognized as health. So being able to kind of step aside and do my own research, whether it was just through scrolling through social media feeds or reading blog posts or going into more like detailed uh, psychological like articles, anything like that, I started really shifting my interest to there and thinking about, okay, I've really missed some gaps in my own personal life. So going into my freshman year of college, that was something where I was going out of state. I was leaving my family behind pretty much. And I was, it was just me out here in Amherst, Massachusetts. I didn't know anybody. So this is really my time to say, okay, let's, I'm out here alone. So let's focus on me. Let's do whatever I need to do to just start thinking about these things that needs to change in my own life. So it was definitely, I think that being able to go off independently was a, a super big help in my own life and my own journey. Uh, just because I know sometimes if you're in the same environment, and you're doing the same things every single day that you've always done, it can be hard to kind of shift that routine and shift the way that you've done things. So I took advantage of that kind of transition to really start that journey and really dive into some, some good changes. 
Yeah, I love how you mentioned the environment because that's a huge part of it. If said, if you're stuck in a tough environment, it's going to be tough to change yourself and making your environment optimal to help you with your personal development, self-help or mental health journey is very important. So what are some things that you kind of set up your environment to just be optimal for your mental health? Yeah, definitely. And it's, I think a lot of environment, when it comes down to the nature versus nurture discussion, I always think nurture is like a huge key piece of it. And nurture isn't just about childhood, in my opinion. I think it's just you what people are nurtured in their environment all throughout their lives. So thinking about the people who I'm surrounded with, the people who are willing to like just chat with me, even if it's not about anything that I'm like dealing with, if it's just them giving me a positive energy that I can really build momentum on and have like a positive domino effect throughout my day. That's what I really enjoy. So um, I guess like one example of my environment now, right now I live with a, a group of really awesome peers and we're all kind of in the same types of like extracurricular activities. We all do the same kind of volunteer work. Um, and so we have like a shared context of what our day-to-day -day lives are because we all kind of understand what the what the responsibilities each person is going through. So we all have that as a, a, a factor of our support system. And then added on top of that, like we're always pushing each other to do better. It's always great to have people with great energies around me um, as well as being able to, to work in that environment and work with them. It's cool to have that kind of not we're not necessarily similarly minded but we have kind of similar base of experiences that we can always if we're going through something help each other navigate which i think is is super helpful um but that's one of the key pieces of environment to me is just the people around you as well as in a whole bunch of different activities so the people that i don't live with i have like a whole bunch of different just friend groups and different things so i have my volunteer friend group i have my like the athletics friend group i have my my classes friend group and they all kind of nurture me in different ways uh, and just different realms of professional development, personal development, uh, emotional development, spiritual development, all the all across the board. That's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely important. I know that basically when I was going through mental health issues, I felt like I was all alone, that there was nobody I could talk to. And then once you speak up and you tell other people, you realize that people are going through similar things and that it's going to be harder to go through it if you're keeping this stuff all to yourself. So that's great just to, like for people listening to this and watching that, just always know that you can tell somebody, even though if they might not understand exactly what you're going through, they could have known somebody who's going through something similar or they themselves are going through something similar. Mm -hmm. And you talked about volunteer work and I read that you were, you're like the student chief, chief deputy of the fire department or something. What was like that? that. <laughs> something like that. Uh, it's called like the deputy chief. Uh, and so Amherst Fire Department has this uh, program called the Student Force, which is an entirely student run engine company or an auxiliary <clears throat> excuse me an auxiliary engine company and we support the career force around the town of Amherst we staff a fire truck uh typically in a normal semester in a non-coronavirus world uh seven nights a week uh just overnight and it's all volunteer we get to learn all of the basic necessary firefighting skills and then respond to calls and help the community so it's cool to be be in this program being able to help share the knowledge that I've learned from other upperclassmen that have passed it down to me. It's been a super great experience in the town of Amherst. That's so cool. So how, how does one get started with that? How, how did you even decide that that was what you wanted to do? Because I assume you probably started that freshman year. Yeah, I did. It was my third day on campus and I had literally never thought about firefighting before. Firefighters were always those like people who you see around and you're like, that is so cool. That's a fire truck. That's awesome. Uh, but I was literally afraid of heights fire and confined spaces I was like afraid of it all um and then I jumped into extracurricular activity pretty much that is all three of those things combined um uh, putting yourself in those situations voluntarily so um my third day on campus there we have an annual U fest in the middle in the beginning of the semester for freshmen that kind of gives the overview of resources that are available around campus um and so I was there it was like really rain it's like pouring rain that day I don't know why I think it was just there because I didn't have anything else to do but I was walking around with my new roommates just trying to get a feel of Amherst Massachusetts and UMass so I was walking around this festival saw this fire truck there and the sign um there was a whole sign with a whole bunch of words on it but all I took away was um volunteer student firefighters so I walked over and I was like what is this and they kind of explained the program gave me a rundown and I was sold. I signed up and applied and got an interview. And here I am four years later. Wow, that's awesome. I love how you say like 
doing something that made you uncomfortable because mm -hmm. that's something that through my own journey, like doing meditation and cold showers and exercise and pushing your comfort zone is really the best for you, but it's not always going to be in line with what your ego wants. And when you kind of push it aside, you realize that you have a lot more strength, a lot more capacity than you could have ever imagined. Like what are some of the key takeaways that you've seen through like your own personal growth through the firefighting? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good question. As far as pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. I think for me, I'm really fortunate that in my life, I've had a very good support system and I have not been limited at all by like my parents' expectations of me or their desires for me. Uh, even going back to high school, like I, uh, my senior year, I, after playing soccer for pretty much my entire life, my senior year of high school, I switched to playing football uh, just because I love the sport of football. I really, at the time, I really wanted to work in football and I wanted to be able to say like, I worked, in, I played football, so I know. Because being a woman in sport, I'm a sport management major. So being a woman in sport, a lot of times you could be undermined for working in men's athletics if you've never played men's athletics. So I a little bit wanted to say like, I played football. I can, I'm validated and I can work in this sport. Um, but it's a little bit backwards thinking now that I look back at it, because you don't need to have to play the sport to work in a sport and be success, successful. But that was my thought process as a junior in high school. Um, as well as I just wanted to play the sport because it's my favorite sport and I had never had the opportunity to play competitively and it's probably going to be my last chance. So that was an example of just, honestly, I didn't ever tell my parents. I didn't ask my parents if I could play. It wasn't like a, hey, how would you all feel about if I played football? I just one day said like, oh, I'm playing football next year, just so you guys know. And they completely, I was nervous to tell them because I didn't know what their reaction would be because there are so many girls who want to play football that their parents don't let them. They think it's too rough for them. They think that the social environment isn't going to be good, but they were just kind of like, okay, <laughs> this is, we this is strange. This is, I don't know, this is something that we have not seen <laughs> before, but if you want to go after it, then you go after it, but it's going to be hard. So they kind of had that very supportive structure that even though I'm diving into something completely uncomfortable, it's something that it was a whole new realm for me, especially because my school, I'm from a school district where a lot of the schools combine to play sports. So I was playing football at a school that wasn't my actual high school. So I didn't really know that many people on the team, maybe a few. So I'm kind of diving into this brand new school, this brand new environment, this brand new sport, uh, brand new people, um, brand new culture, because now I'm jumping in with all uh, young men. And I, I had like guy friends at the time, but I, that wasn't my whole like social life. So diving to this brand new thing, there's the physical adversity of playing a sport that I'd never played before. And there's the social adversity of being with a group I've never really been with before and trying to navigate that. So a very uncomfortable situation because I had that support of my parents, because I never really had them doubting me, the people that I cared about most of my life, because none of them were doubting me. Uh, I felt like fine. I was like, okay, well, I can do it. Like they don't, they don't doubt me. Like there's no reason I can't do this and show that it's possible and go have fun and play sport that I really want to play. So that's kind of being able to have that support system, which is a privilege because not everybody has that. Uh, and it's, that's why I think it's so important to be supportive because it really can make a difference. And if somebody is able to put themselves out of their comfort zone, um, that was, that was the huge key piece for me. Wow. That is, that is just super inspiring. And just kind of, I, I guess like you decided because you thought you had to do that. You kind of felt like you had to do it. It wasn't even that you wanted to do it. You probably wanted to, but you felt like you had to for your career. So what, what position did you try out for? Yeah. So I was the kicker. So the kind of an easier transition going from soccer to playing kicker. I was a little bit in luck because there was no kicker on the team at the time. Um, and so it was, it was fine. I kind of just spoke to the football coach and was like, Hey, would you be okay if I played? <laughs> and he was like, he, he needed to talk to my parents. He wanted to make sure that they were on the same page as him. And so they chatted, they make sure we were all on the same page, that it was all going to be fine. If I played, I would not, it was, I was not like trying to hide it from anyone. Um, and so I was able to fill that kicker role, um, kicked, PATs, point after touchdowns, made some, a couple extra points throughout the season. I didn't have like a million opportunities to kick throughout the season, but that's totally fine because I, and I also, I will say I was terrible. Like I was absolutely like probably one of the worst that East high school has ever seen. Uh, but that's okay. Like I, I, it was, it's frustrating kind of looking at that experience when I was there, I was very frustrated. I was like, 
oh my gosh, I'm the only girl on the team and I am terrible. Like I am terrible. Like I don't understand anything that's happening. And I'm representing girls as bad at football right now, which I understand that mindset. But looking back, I wasn't just a girl playing football and I wasn't bad because I was a girl playing football. I was bad because I had never played football before in my entire life and then decided to make a switch and then had to really pick up the pace. And there's a steep learning curve when you're picking up the sport like football that you've never played before or any sport really. Um, so as somebody who that was their first time playing football, the amount of work that I put into it and the amount of fun that I had, like it didn't matter that I was terrible because I was having the time of my life with awesome new friends, awesome new setting um, and had a really like pretty, really positive experience overall. That's awesome. I just know me personally, I would never play football. Just like, I don't, I don't want to get a concussion. I don't want anything that, did you ever like feel like you got a concussion playing football? No, I mean, I was, I would be in hitting drills. Like I would, I would pretty much do every single drill at every single practice uh, when I wasn't just kicking and practicing my own kicking. So when we had tackling drills, any kind of conditioning, all that kind of stuff, I was always in it. I was not in really a set alternative special teams type training plan so I would be in hitting practice I will say the guys on my team did not hit me <laughs> really hard ever um for all bunch of different reasons I think a lot of a lot of the reasons were social they were like I, coach I'm not hitting a girl I just cannot I literally cannot like I was a lot of their reasoning was like I wasn't raised to hit a girl I don't feel comfortable doing this and at the time I was very frustrated with that because I just wanted to be treated like every other player and I just wanted to be I just wanted to be on the team and I want a part of that is hitting and I wanted to hit because I I thought it was that's why I like football it's fun to like that physicality of the sport playing that I wanted that experience so I got a little taste of it although it wasn't the full on force so concussions are are a real deal within football within a lot of different youth athletics like hockey is another one lacrosse um so it is it is a real deal but me personally I never had that kind of rough and tumble super rough football experience yeah, I think your your uh, brain will be thanking you for that in um you know either a couple of years or even now. So where where did that like kind of like deep love of football come from? Just like uh, so that's kind of just like the main sport that we watched in my house growing up. I that's the one that if ever my dad was passing around the football with my brothers and me, it was uh, was passing around a ball with me. It was a football. So always out in the street, uh, passing the ball around um it was just the thing that we always watched so we're New York Jets fans so we'd sit around to watch them lose all the time yes their face is adequate it's fine it's fine one day one day Ari they're gonna go to the Super Bowl in like the year 20 I mean let's say the year 2065 they're gonna go to the Super Bowl and I'm be like this is the day of my dreams and everything's gonna turn around but it's fine it's fine it teaches you to be humble if you're a Jets fan. Anyway, that's just a side note. Um, but that was, it's always my memory of playing in the leaves, playing in the street, tossing the football around. And I have two older brothers, so they would really be doing the throwing. And then every once in a while, they would like pitch it to me. And I'd be like, yes, I'm included. <laughs> and then I just really, I just really loved watching it. It was a big family thing for me, that sport was. Uh, so being able to, I really, really started to expand how much I loved it, started going to games probably around my freshman year of high school. So that freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I was like, football is me. I love football. I want to do football. I want to work in football, all that kind of stuff. So all that kind of just built up to me wanting to play the sport that I love the most. No, I really commend you for that, especially like maintaining that passion, especially when you see your team lose game after game after game. <laughs> and I just, I just think that's awesome that I honestly don't really know a lot of girls that are just super into football like that, or even super into sports in general. Have you met, I assume you probably met more people now that you're in like a sports program at a university that are more like you, but did you have people like that in high school that were really as into sports as you? I mean, yeah, I think there's, there's tons of girls who are into athletics. And I think it's a huge misconception that girls just aren't into sports, uh, especially if they aren't like viewing the, the typical mainstream, like big four sports. So if like, if a girl doesn't watch the NBA, the NFL, 
um, NHL or MLB, then she's not a sports person, which there's so many other leagues you could watch. There's so many other sports. So if you're into equestrian sports, lacrosse, um, if you're into the soccer, if you're into the WNBA, if you're into the National Women's Soccer League, if you're into any of those things, all those are a little bit illegitimized if you're a woman in sport and that's what you like watching or even like fast pitch softball, anything, anything along those lines. So if you, I grew up playing sports with girls and they're, as good as me they're as into it as me they're even more so so it's I don't know I I think it's a huge misconception misconception that girls aren't into it being in a sport management program now we are underrepresented within the sport industry on academic level and within employment so within the corporate world Uh, but being in the space I'm in now it has never been a better time to be a woman in sport because we are, and I think this past year has kind of expanded with a lot of athlete activism, a lot of different types of kind of women speaking up at the forefront. In 2019, a lot of conversations about equal pay for women when the National Women's Soccer Team won the World Cup, but still were being underpaid. So um, all of these kind of things have been building up on a social level for this these past few years, which has been super great to see. And I think it's really creating a domino effect in the corporate world and the academic world. Um, I think organizations and academic programs are getting they're getting the point more that they need to expand and diversify their classes so that the sport industry can be diversified and it all creates a, a better I don't know, a twofold realm of is better for society and is just the right thing to do if the corporate sport world is more diverse and that's that's women, that's people with disabilities, that's people of color, um, that's uh, non-heterosexual individuals, that's all that whole realm. Um, and there's also the realm of it's more profitable because you have, it's just a statistically factual uh, that if you have a more diverse workforce, then you're going to be more profitable because you have better ideas flowing, more diverse realm of ideas, more diverse ability to, to connect with different populations. So as all these things are coming up, I've had the opportunity to meet so many amazing women in sport, so many, so many, like the, the greatest minds that I feel like I am so privileged to know. Uh, and those are people from like top executive levels down to people who are graduating from college this year. And it's, it's great to see. And it's, the women in sport are here. They are here, truly. Even if they're not in like the mainstream realm of they watch football every single Sunday with their dad in that kind of setting. Like they're they're in sport in that way and in other ways. Yeah, you heard it here first. They're here. <laughs> they're back. I honestly like how you mentioned that because it makes me understand how kind of like a narrow vision I have of it. That kind of like, oh, if you don't watch the big four sports and you're not like a sports fan, because I kind of see it now and I am in the personal belief. I'm kind of dumb with the NBA. I think the NBA is so dumb. Like the players are just like such divas. They call terrible fouls based on nothing. And I can say the same with the MLB. And I think a lot of this has to do with the players getting overpaid and they kind of don't have like that humility that they had back when like, I think that college basketball is more entertaining now. And the Mm -hmm. same with like women's, I honestly think that women's college basketball is more entertaining than the NBA. Now, a lot of people will watch this and, try to come at me, but you know, that's just my opinion. And I really like how you talked about just the diversity and all this. And I just know that I'm doing this all by myself right now, but if I was ever to get a partner, it would probably be somebody that's female because I need somebody that has kind of the other half of it. Like I only have one perspective of all this. And there's a lot of skills that I'm missing that I couldn't just fill by myself. That's just kind of how this works. And I wish a lot more organizations understood this. So what would you say is kind of the what's the angle that you bring into a company that they're missing? Like, why do they need you or somebody like you? Yeah. And it's, I feel like I'm in a job interview right now. Like, this is why you should hire me. Um, but it's every single person has had a diverse experience in the world. So when you're speaking about, if you were to ever take on a partner for whatever ventures that you have, yes, completely. I think it is, it is so, I don't know if, if it's well proven, but it's, it's always the best way to go about it. If you're choosing a, a person from a diverse background, um, and to somebody who has had different life experiences than you, because you're able to, like you're saying, bring up different elements and bring up different different pieces and different perspectives. Um, I just read Stacey Abrams' book, um, and it's she mentions within it 
a lot of that, that importance of diversifying your partnership. So you're able to touch on a whole bunch of different realms, which is awesome, as well as your mentorships, like being able to have mentors who, who like look different ways and have had different experiences and come from way different backgrounds, because that's a, a, another super useful way to soak in different perspectives and different life experiences for people that like for experiences that you could never have as yourself like I could never have an experience as a person of color because I'm a white woman like so being able to speak with people and maybe we're not having conversations about race every time we chat but I'm able to have a perspective from somebody who's a has a diverse a, a perspective that is different from mine so it's always super helpful uh, as far as how I would personally fit into a company I mean it depends always on the company and every single every single person has something different to add to a company I don't know how much I would add to a company if it's all white women from upper middle class backgrounds in that company from let's say even if it's from Western New York, we want to get super specific, but maybe I would add a lot to a company that is all, I don't know, men from rural South Carolina, because I'm from the Northeast, something like that, if that makes sense. So it all depends on the company as far as what I add. The biggest picture is that you're just able to be a unique puzzle piece in a kind of diverse puzzle, if that makes sense. Yeah, unless you end up starting your own company and you become the puzzle creator, mm -hmm. such as um, the Rising Phoenix, <clears throat> yeah. sorry, the Rising Phoenix Sports Program. Yes, exactly. So hopefully, if I'm able to develop a team for my program, so I guess background on the organization is it's a it's a juvenile it's a sport for development program for girls in the juvenile justice system, and it's very much in its infancy. But I would hope to grow it and develop a team so that we can start making a lot of really awesome tangible change. And I think a diverse team is going to be super important in that, especially when we get down to the coaching level, being able to have coaches who are well-informed, have a basis of trauma-informed care, but who also can relate firsthand to the experiences of the girls who are in that justice system, I think is super important. So being able to have people with a whole bunch of varying experiences, but also the ones that kind of can bridge the gap of that shared experience of those, those, those girls that we want to serve, I think is another super crucial piece of it. Yeah. And this really all comes down to like the miseducation or undereducation of these issues. These issues, they're stigmatized. People don't want to talk about them, but they are real issues. And I like that there are people like you are out there that are like trying to tell people like, these are real issues. Why can't you guys listen? Exactly. Um, I, yeah, and it's, it's a lot of, especially within the prison system and the, the justice system in general, it, it's a system that is designed to push people away and kind of keep them out of sight, out of mind so that the general public does not have to see them, deal with them, um, have them in their communities. Uh, so when they push them away to places far outside towns or just outside of city lines, then they are not necessarily thought of and they're kind of forgotten and people also kind of forget their humanity and i'm not saying that people every single person in the justice system is like doesn't deserve to be there and like it's completely wrong to have them locked up here and they they deserve to just be out in the streets doing whatever because actions have consequences and it's it's important to to if you have done something wrong to write that wrong in a way and to to be able to be in an environment where we're able to make amends or be rehabilitated or make better progress as a human because no action is without consequences. Um, but being able to remember the humanity of that individual and try to track down maybe why they landed up in that certain situation, how did they get to that point, I think is, is a crucial piece for me, especially when it comes to the juvenile justice system. And especially when it comes to girls in the juvenile justice system, because a lot of times, girls who end up in the justice system end up there for for a reason. Statistically, there's a lot of family violence that girls in the justice system have endured before they're ever incarcerated. I think it's a statistic like 84% of girls in the justice system have experienced family violence. Uh, and there's just super high rates of those girls having experienced some type of abuse, um, just bad family situations, some kind of traumatic incidences that have led them down certain paths to, to make certain criminal decisions. 
that's even tracked in kind of the crimes that they often commit. So if you look at one of some of the most common crimes like running away, truancy, drug abuse, um, those are all very commonly linked to having experienced that kind of abuse because they're trying to get away from it, whether they're physically running away from it or they're trying to get away from it through uh, drug usage or alcohol usage, if that, um, just to kind of make that connection. As well as you have a crime like forced prostitution, which if you're a minor in whatever state that you're in, um, so under the age of 17 or 18 or if 16, whatever the age of consent is based on the state, um, if you're under that age, then an adult having sex with you is, is by definition considered rape. But in those situations, those girls are criminalized for it. So those actions are criminalized for the girls because they have partaken in what's called prostitution. So a lot of times those girls can go into detention centers because they've been in that situation. So it's very, a lot of people don't see these links because it's it kind of takes some research. It kind of takes the initiative to go out and dig and go find it. So one of the things that I want to do as I'm kind of in the infancy of building out my organization, Rising Phoenix, is just putting this information out there so people can kind of understand that link. Remember the humanity of these girls who are in the justice system and try to build support for how to help them and how to help them heal, how to help them navigate and move forward so that they can go into something come forward from something that was so dark into something that has so much potential because they have so much potential. Wow. I, I'm glad you shared all those examples. And that really like pisses me off just to like hear that, that people can get locked up. I don't think anybody can get, should be able to get locked up for drug use, especially when like, if you're young and you're using drugs, it's probably because your parents were using drugs around you or somebody was giving you drug. I just think that one thing specifically is probably like, half of like incarcerations in America are like drug use, which is like baffling to me. But then you see what are the motivations behind this? Well, you know, they, the corporations, the private prisons need to make money and the, the opioid companies need to make money because they don't want you to use, you know, weed and other things. And now that's legal in some places, but do you have any stats on like the specific drugs that they get like incarcerated for? I don't have any statistics on that. I mean, I think most common drug use is marijuana, um, but I don't have any strong statistics on what they most commonly shift towards. Um, I definitely agree that it is it is a difficult line to walk, figuring out like who should be incarcerated for drug use. Uh, marijuana has been decriminalized in many states and perhaps there should be some kind of reparations for people who are still serving time in those states for that drug use. Um, they should, that's a whole different realm. That's a whole different can of worms we could get into. Um, but the, the the bigger picture, especially when working with youth, is I definitely agree with you. And it's and it's not just an assumption of like, oh, these girls they're only using drugs because X Y Z happened to them, or um, maybe like these person that people are giving them drugs or their parents. It's not even an assumption. It's just kind of factually based statistics that girls who have experienced that violence often use drugs or alcohol as a way to move away from it and keep themselves, I don't know, in a keep their minds at least being able to cope with whatever they're dealing with on a on a physical or an emotional level. So um, it's not every single girl in the justice system, but it's such a large percentage of them that it is meaningful and it is significant. And I hope to be able to make some kind of impact to address those types of issues and help those girls. I love that. And I know that like you're you're in a similar spot as me is you're kind of like in the infant stages, the beginning stages. And like, as I kind of call this my business, this is kind of like the awareness building stage, the brand building stage where I'm trying to like give out free value, build awareness around these issues, these mental health issues that really happen and just provide free value. So what are you doing? I know you're doing some Instagram posts, but what else are you doing or do you plan to do in kind of like the next year or two to start to educate people to start to build this awareness? Yeah, for sure. So very much along with you in the kind of the brand building stages. So I uh, have started launching Instagram on February 11th, which time has flown because I'm looking at the date. It's April 23rd. So it's it's crazy that time, time has flown that much. Um, so I've started kind of using social media as that channel to get education out there, create content, uh, confirm brand identity and build that brand identity uh, just by the posts and the, the tone and the language that I use, as well as trying to provide other people with kind of language around this topic. Cause I think a lot of people, a lot of people are slow to speak on things if they don't know how to speak about them. And I think the justice system 
it's one of those topics for sure where they a lot of people might feel um, like anxious or they might feel like angry about the current state of the justice system, but they don't necessarily have the language to speak on it and they don't feel confident speaking on it if they aren't completely well informed. So one of my goals right now is just being able to give people language, give people statistics, give people an overview, trying to outline the links between how all of these things work within the juvenile justice system and how they affect girls, as well as how to why sport and why a sport for development program is gonna be the best platform to help those girls. So when I think of my own organization, it is a sport for development program. And so what that means is it's using sport participation, which sport for development comes in many shapes and sizes. You can do any sport really um, in a lot of different curriculums or structures, but basically using sport and that physical activity as a platform to develop life skills, increase self-esteem, increase confidence, and increase kind of that that social um, that social uh, social esteem, I guess, and social capabilities and, and environment and team and community, all that kind of stuff. So sport is really the way I explain it, sport is the sport is a train that is carrying on this train on the way to to helping and supporting girls in justice system. Uh, sport is the train that is getting all these other things there, like that self-esteem and that confidence, and it's getting all these other things there. So being able to develop a curriculum that really helps exacerbate the building of these life skills and really helps support the building of these life skills is definitely what's been in the background of all my other work right now. So a lot of conversations with people who work in the juvenile justice system and a lot of different roles, whether it's as a superintendent or a teacher or a counselor um, or a programs coordinator, uh, working with some academics who have studied youth in the justice system, speaking to other people who have ran uh, sport for development programs, uh, both ones in the justice system and out of the justice system, and then other people who have run programs within the justice system that aren't necessarily sports. So being able to have conversations with these people to kind of, like we were talking about before with diverse perspectives, people from a whole different realms of different touch points of the industry, being able to go to them and ask them questions and being able to soak things in so I can have a more holistic perspective. Um, I'm kind of in a purgatory of this organization right now because we're in a pandemic. And so it's difficult to go in and start doing that uh, initial in-person programming, as well as because it's within the juvenile justice system, being able to achieve 501c3 status and have that kind of credibility is another super crucial key point. So that's all kind of the background work going on as far as waiting for the pandemic to end, uh, but also working to get that credibility, building out a more specific curriculum, um, trying to recruit coaches so that I think that people that make a, a really good fit once I know where I'll be geographically. That's all the background work while I'm kind of trying to drive forward on social media, all of this messaging, educational resources, things that people would need to kind of understand what it is that Rising Phoenix is all about, why it's important, um, and what we're hoping to do. Yeah, I love that. And I love the parallels between all this stuff because I can see this so clearly as it's basically that, especially as a kid, you have all this energy, but everybody always has all this energy and a lot of people are misdirecting it, using it towards negative things. And sport is one way where you can redirect this energy, shift it to doing something more positive, more constructive, more just like socializing and building these skills. And the way for me is because I always played sports up until like basically I started college. And then when I didn't have that outlet, I felt lost. I felt didn't have this way to express this like built up energy, started doing negative things and overthinking. And that's another way that people spend energy negatively. And then I found meditation and journaling and writing and making music and things like that. So I like how there's kind of like a parallel and an overlap between all this stuff that I think sport is definitely one of the most effective ways because it's not just the physical, just like exercise, but it's also like the social bonding. And you don't, you just don't get that in a time like this where everybody's just so separated. Mm -hmm, exactly. And it's, it's been hard over this past year to find those sport opportunities. And I know a lot of sport for development programs that have existed, have really struggled in this past year to provide that programming because how can you like a, we're only really just getting back to those stages of being able to play on a recreational and an amateur level, all those, all those close contact sports. So it's, I definitely hear what you're saying as kind of how, how it's been difficult, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but it's, it's so 
important to see all of those programs come back as well as it's I think this is another time where a lot of more of these programs are popping up to really help and support youth. So I'm I'm honored to be able to be a part of this movement of sport for development so I can drive forward all these things. Because like you're saying, sport is something that really everybody can participate in. And it's something that I love because it is so human. Like people in every single culture across the world can participate in play or sport in some way or another. Um, there are definitely discrepancies within how that sport participation is accessible. Um, in some cultures, it's accessible to different types of people. Even in within the United States, different sports are accessible based on your physical ability. Um, so there's there's definitely gaps in accessibility, but there is sport across the board. And having able being able to have that human connection through play is so uh, it's magical to me. At least I struggle to even conceptualize and articulate about it because it's something that I know has like touched my own life and has brought me close to people and I'm not unique in that sport has brought so many people the ability to connect with other people and understand kind of those human connections and grow those human connections while also kind of developing their own sense of capabilities and self-esteem and there's a lot of research that uh, there's a lot of research that supports sport participation increasing and boosting your own self-esteem and your own self-confidence and ability to navigate kind of these difficult times in our kind of um, not even emotional development, but having to navigate difficult emotions, uh, it is it is such a great outlet for being able to do all of that. So definitely something that I wanna make super accessible to everybody in the world, but starting with these girls in the juvenile justice system who are a lot of times overlooked and underserved when it comes to a lot of, first of all, girl-centered programming, but then just any kind of sport programming in person in general. Yeah. I love that. I love the whole like play aspect of it as well, because this is something I've kind of noticed over the past couple of days. So like everybody's kind of just so serious and like pessimistic and negative about a lot of stuff. But like that's not really like how life is supposed to be, at least in my eyes, life is supposed to be about play and having fun and spreading love and all this stuff. And I think our society has kind of neglected that for profits. And you've kind of seen how this has affected people on a mass scale. And I just like how, I, again, I, you can't even put it into words, kind of like that magical feeling that you get when you're like on a team or working towards a goal, but not working towards a goal in like a corporation that's like heartless, working towards a goal of just like playing to win a game and just like having fun. There's really nothing, there's really nothing better than that. And you don't, you don't play to like win a trophy or something. I mean, maybe they do at the end of the season, but like you just play for like bragging rights. You just play because it's just fun to play and have fun with your friends. Mm -hmm. exactly it's there's so many wonderful things that can come up from sports so being able to help give more people the opportunity that is why I feel so called to it and that's why I feel so strongly towards it so as trying to be as thoughtful as possible throughout kind of this building up and development of my organization so that it can make the most possible change and bring people the most possible ability to play that sport because echoing everything you just said it's just it is magical and it is great and it's fun um, and it is so helpful in such practical ways when it comes to developing all these life skills and um, just confidence, self-esteem, all I, lots of things that are super helpful in our own development as people. Yeah. All right. So this is big picture thinking going to make you think tough here. Okay. If you had to think 10 years in the future, what would have to have happened to you to think like, all right, this was a success. I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. 10 years in the future. So 2030, 2031. Yeah. Okay, 2031, all right. Um, cool, so this is a good question. So I've always measured success. I think backing up a little bit, I think every single person measures success in a different way. There's no right or wrong way to measure success. There are people who measure it financially, um, who have, they have a higher paying salary. They're like, yes, I'm successful. There's some people who measure it um, based on like how many people they know. They're like, yes, I know all these people. I have all these people in my network. That's all correct. Like they're all right because that's their own version of success. For me, my version of success is it's quantified based on how many people I've been able to make a positive impact on or help or support in some way. So in order to be successful, I just want this program to be able to have helped people. And the more successful it is, then the 
that's the more people that I've helped. Honestly, I have put all this work into it and I'll continue putting work into it with the help of, with the hope of just helping one person. So if I've helped one girl, if I've helped shift her self, uh, selfish self-esteem so that she can be a success story walking out of a, a juvenile detention center so she can move forward with her life positively so that she can have more skills to go forward and heal and go about her own life and fulfill her potential, then I've done it. I've, I'm successful. And I want to be able to not hopefully not just help one person but be able to help a whole bunch of different people along the way um but that's what i'm shooting for is just being able to help that that person and hopefully it comes in many different shapes and sizes what that success looks like and hopefully it isn't stagnant and hopefully it can, can continue and continue to grow and grow and develop uh but that's really the goal is being able to help someone somewhere uh through whatever whatever need, means necessary being able to to do that and hopefully I'm able to develop a, a system that works for not just one person, but however many people participate in the program, however many people are there for me to help. I love that. I just think it's funny just like hearing all the parallels between like what I was going through, even like last year when I started, I had the same thing. I was just like, all right, if I can just help one person and I've already seen helping one person and two and three, and like, I know that I've already been successful in what I'm doing, but I also know that like, I want to help a million people, but it's never going to be enough. It's like, all right, but if I help a million people, then I want to help 10 million people or a billion or the entire world. And I know that there are definitely some people that can't be helped because it's, it's, and this is kind of the struggle that I had. It was kind of like, I wanted to be like, like I, I kind of metaphor a good metaphor is like you're climbing up a mountain i want to be able to like drag people by the collar up the mountain that's not how it works mm -hmm. it's that you got to climb up the mountain yourself show people how it's done show people that it's possible but you can't give people the motivation to want to climb up for them if you drag them up the mountain and they get to the top and they don't even want to be there because they didn't climb up the mountain they didn't go through the struggles they didn't but you can kind of drop gems you can kind of leave a trail show them what you did and I think that's a perfect just like analogy for anything, especially what you're doing is that like you can't force the people to want to change, but you can give them a good infrastructure, give them a good just like foundation to be them best selves. But it's ultimately up to them to take the resources that you're giving them and using them constructively. Mm -hmm. For sure. I don't know if I even have anything to add to that. It's kind of a, I agree. People, it has to come from an internal place of wanting to, wanting to be in a positive light and wanting to, to have positive influences on you and make positive change because we all have the capacity to make positive change and that has to come from an internal place uh, but if I can be on an external level and say like these are here for you whenever <laughs> whenever you need them and we're here and we're going to be consistent and we're showing up and we're not here to hurt anyone we're here to only help and support and nurture like we were saying before and just try to create a positive environment that's all that's all I want to accomplish. So it's, yes, echoing everything you just said, I have not much to add. Yeah. So just a couple more questions, just because we only have a couple of minutes. So how would you define, it's pretty abstract at the moment, but how would you define at, like success for helping somebody? Like what characteristics would they have built or what like emotions would they have or life skills? Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends on the person because every single person is the unique individual and their needs are going to differ based on what their life is like. I think especially being able to develop self-esteem and confidence are two of the main ones that I am super invested in and why sport is super helpful in delivering those on a platform um, just because there's just research about how that sport participation, like when you, when you really develop playing in a sport and you get better at a sport, that development of competency uh, really helps boost your self-esteem. It's like, yes, I'm capable of something. And yes, I can do this. Like, I like started throwing free throws and one day I like, couldn't make any of them, but now third day in the row play, uh, throwing three free throws and now I can make every single one pretty much. Um, so it's kind of like that feeling of competency. It's like, oh yes, I'm awesome. I put the work in, I do this. So it's great. Uh, and that can kind of relate to a life skill of like, okay, maybe you start off doing something and you're not good at it. And maybe it's like a job or maybe it's a social relationship or maybe it's schoolwork or maybe it's anything like that. But it's just a, being able to see changes and keep working because you know you're going to see changes at some point or see improvements that's just one example but as far as tangible life skills and tangible kind of feelings and emotional development kind of dependent on the person but those are kind of the overarching ones that I think are are some of the key things that sport can really deliver 
Yeah. And one of the things that's super important about this, is that these are all subjective. Like it's up to the person to be like, yes, I am confident now. Like I know personally, I used to have zero confidence and that took me years to build and through building skills, through building writing poetry and making music and just like talking on camera. So it's super important that just like these people know that they're confident now. And I bet a lot of these people aren't confident at the moment just because of kind of the, like the drain they've had on their energy from their environment. I think it goes back to the whole nature nurture thing. Like you can't really, sure you can, people should take a little responsibility, but when you're younger, it's really mostly about the environment and your parents and who you hang around. And there's really not much you can do, but you can teach people and they can learn as they grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think confidence is so powerful and I think it's so important to have. It's, I feel like if you're confident, then you're more, you're, if you feel like more able to ask people for what you deserve, you're more able to stand up for yourself and be your own best advocate. Um, you're able to just kind of go around and know like, okay, whatever happens today, like I'm me, I'm still awesome. I still have these skills. I'm still like, like I'm still a good listener and I still like to write and I still am all these things, X, Y, and Z. So it kind of is a, like a protective barrier that kind of helps you kind of navigate through life. And I think most people struggle with confidence. Like I'm not confident most all, all the time. Like I, everybody has, every single person, even the most confident person in the world is going to have those moments where they're like, Ooh, I don't feel my best today. And I feel not so great. So, um, which is fine. That's another completely like human emotion and a completely valid, like human feeling. Um, but just being able to build it up as much as I can, hopefully through that sport platform, uh, I think it's super powerful. I love that. So do you have any, uh, parting words for the audience? Anything, any, any gems of wisdom to leave us with? Um, I don't know how many gems of wisdom I could add. I would say I am very confident in saying that I don't know exactly what I'm doing <laughs> in life. And that's totally fine. I think anybody really knows what they're doing. Uh, but I think there's, the, I think that's important to say because being transparent that you don't know what you're doing is what helps other people know they're like, oh, that's obtainable for me to do. Cause I think some people might look at me and say, like some people have said it before, they look at me and they're like, oh my gosh, you have it's so together. Like you're so dialed in. Like I could never do all these things that you do. And I'm like sitting here, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I just hop on my computer and I do some research and I try to figure it out. And I talk to some people, like, I don't really know. So whatever you want to do, like if you're listening to this, like whatever you want to do, it's completely achievable. And it's fine that you don't know what you're doing because you don't have to know what you're doing to figure it out and just start it. Um, so that's kind of the biggest, the biggest or only really thing else I would have to add. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this episode. Uh, again, special guest, Alana Scardino. This is a great episode. I truly enjoyed this and uh, have a great day.